Ladd III accepts with pleasure the kind invitation of Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert Channing Gardner for a birthday party in honor of their daughter Melissa on April 18th, 1937 at half past three o'clock. Dear Andy, thank you for the birthday present. I have a lot of Oz books, but not The Lost Princess of Oz. What made you give me that one? Sincerely yours, Melissa. I'm answering your letter about the book. When you came into second grade with that stuck-up nurse, you looked like a lost princess. I don't believe what you wrote. I think my mother told your mother to get that book. I like the pictures more than the words. Now let's stop writing letters. I will make my L's taller than my D's. I will close up my A's and my O's. I will try to make longer P's. Pass it on. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Will you be my valentine? Were you the one who sent me a valentine saying, will you be my valentine? Yes, I sent it. Then I will be, unless I have to kiss you. <laughs> when it's warmer out, can I come over and swim in your pool? No, you can't. I have a new nurse named Miss Hawthorne who thinks she'll give me infantile paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> will you help me go down and get the milk and cookies during recess? I will if you don't ask me to marry you again. I will not write, write personal, personal notes in class. class. I will not, not write my personal <laughs> notes in class. I, I will not. not. <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Love, Andy Ladd. I made this card myself. It's not Santa Claus. It's a kangaroo jumping over a glass of orange juice. Do you like it? I like <laughs> you, Melissa. My mother says I have to apologize in writing. I apologize for sneaking into the girl's bathhouse while you were changing into your bathing suit. Tell Miss Hawthorne I apologize to her, too. <laughs> Here's a picture I drew of you and me without our bathing suits on. Guess which one is you? <laughs> Don't show this to anyone. I love you. Here's a picture of Miss Hawthorne without her bathing suit. <laughs> you can't draw very well, can you? <laughs> Thank you for sending me the cactus plant stuck in the little donkey. I've got lots of presents here in the hospital. I have to write thank you notes for every one. I hate it here. My throat's sore all the time from where they cut out my tonsils. They give me a lot of ice cream, but they also take my temperature the wrong way. <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Why did they send you to another school this year? Merry Christmas. They think I should be with all boys. You made me promise to send you a postcard. This is it. You're supposed to write personal notes on the backs of postcards. For example, here's some questions to help you think of things to say. Do you like Lake Saranac? Is it fun visiting your grandmother? Are your parents really getting divorced? Can you swim out to the deep part of that lake or does Miss Hawthorne make you stay in the shallow part where it's all roped off? Is there anybody there my age, I mean boys? Please write answers to all these questions. No, no, yes, yes, no. <laughs> Dear Melissa, remember me? Andy Ladd? They sent me to camp so I can be with all boys again. This is quiet hours. We have to write home. But I've already done that, so I'm writing to you. There's a real Indian here named Iron Crow who takes us on nature walks and teaches us six new plants a day. This is okay, except he forgot about poison ivy. <laughs> I won the backstroke, which gives me two and a half gold stars. If I get over 50 gold stars by Parents' Day, then I win a leadership prize, which is what my father expects of me. I'm making a napkin ring in shop, which is worth four stars, and which is either for my mother or for you. I hope you'll write me back because when the mail comes every morning, they shout out our names, and it'd be neat to walk up and get a letter from a girl. <laughs> Help! Eek! Yipes! I can't write letters. It took me hours just to write Dear Andy. I write my father because I miss him so much, but to write a boy, hell's bells and oriental smells. <laughs> I'm sending you this picture I drew of our cat instead. Don't you love his expression? It's not quite right, but I tried three times. I drew those jiggly lines around his tail because sometimes the tail behaves like a completely separate person. I love that tail. There's a part of me that feels like that tail. Oh, and here's some bad news. My mother's gotten married again to a man named Hooper McPhail. Help! Let me out of here! I like the cat. Is that the cat?
cat you threw in the pool that time when we were playing over at your house in third grade? No, that was a different cat entirely. This is a dumb Halloween card, wouldn't scare anyone, but I'm really writing about dancing school. My parents say I have to go this year, but I don't see why I have to. I can't figure out why they keep sending us away from girls and then telling us we have to be with them. Are you going to dancing school also? Just write yes or no, since you hate writing. Yes. <laughs> Dear Mrs. McPhail, I want to apologize to you for my behavior in the back of your car coming home last night from dancing school. Charlie and I were just goofing around and I guess I just got out of hand. I'm sorry he had to pull over to the curb and I'm sorry we tore Melissa's dress. <laughs> my father says you should send me the bill and I'll pay for it out of my allowance. Dear Andy, Mommy brought your letter up here to Lake Placid. She thought it was cute. I thought it was dumb. I could tell your father made you write it. You and I both know that the fight in the car was really Charlie's fault and Charlie never apologized. Thank God. That's why I like him, actually. As for you, you shouldn't always do what your parents want, Andy. Even at dancing school, you're always doing just the right thing all the time. You're a victim of your parents sometimes. That was why I picked Charlie to do the rumble with me that time. He <coughs> just hacks around occasionally. I'm enclosing a picture I drew of a dancing bear on a chain. That's you, Andy. Sometimes, I swear. <laughs> I know it seems jerky, but I like writing, actually. I like writing compositions in English. I like writing letters. I like writing you. I wanted to write that letter to your mother because I knew you'd see it, so it was like talking to you when you weren't here. And when you couldn't interrupt. Hint, hint. <laughs> My father says everyone should write letters as much as they can. It's a dying art. He says, letters are a way of presenting yourself in the best possible light to another person. I think that too. I think you sound too much like your father. But I'm not going to argue by mail, and anyway, the skiing's too good. Get well soon. I'm sorry you broke your leg. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy says I broke it purposely because I'm a self-destructive person and went down Whiteface Mountain without asking permission. All I know is I wish I had broken my arm instead so I'd have a good excuse not to write letters. I'm enclosing a picture I drew of the bedpan. <laughs> I'm serious. Don't you love its shape? Andrew M. Ladd III accepts with pleasure the kind invitation of Mrs. R. Ferguson Brown for a dinner in honor of her granddaughter, Melissa Gardner, before the children's charity ball. I'm writing this letter because I'm scared if I called you up, I'd start crying right on the telephone. I'm really mad at you, Andy. Don't you know that when you're invited to a dinner before a dance, you're supposed to dance with the person giving it at least twice? And I don't mean my grandmother, either. I mean, that's why they give dinner parties when people get danced with. I noticed you danced with Ginny Waters, but you never danced with me once. I just think it's rude, that's all. Straighten up and fly right, Andy. How do you expect to get anywhere in life if you're rude to women? Nuts to you, Andy, and that goes double on Sunday. I didn't dance with you because I've got a stretched groin. <laughs> you don't know what that is. Look it up sometime. <laughs> I was going to tell you in person, but I got embarrassed. I stretched it playing hockey last week. The only reason I danced with Ginny Waters is she takes tiny steps. You always make me do those big spins and we could have gotten into serious trouble. I tried it out at home with my mother first and it hurt like hell. That's why I didn't dance with you. I'm using a heating pad now. Maybe we can dance next week at the junior assemblies. I don't believe that hockey stuff. I think Ginny Waters stretched your groin. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> if I went to a psychiatrist, I'd talk about you. Seriously, I would. I think about you all the time. Sometimes I think you just like me because I'm richer than you are. Sometimes I really have that feeling. I think you like the pool and the elevator in my grandmother's house and Simpson and his butler's coat coming in with ginger ale and cookies on a silver tray. I think you like all that stuff just as much as you like me. All I know is my mother keeps saying you'd make a good match. She says if I ever married you, I'd be set up for life. <laughs> but I think it's really just physical attraction. That's why I like going into the elevator with you at your grandmother's that time. Want to try it again? <laughs> Jews. 
Christians here. We have a few Catholics, but they're not too smart, actually. I don't think you can be smart and Catholic at the same time. I was elected to the student council, and I'm arguing for three things. One, I think we should have outside sports rather than keeping them all intramural. I think it would be better to play with Exeter than just play with ourselves. <laughs> Two, I think we should have more than one dance a year. I think female companionship can be healthy occasionally, even for younger boys. And three, I think we should only have to go to chapel once on Sunday. I think it's important to pray to be a better guy and all that, but if you have to do it all day long, you can get quite boring. If you get boring to yourself, just think how much how boring you must be to God. I'm playing left tackle on the third team, and I'll be playing hockey, of course, this winter. And I think I'll try rowing this spring, since I always stank at baseball. Now, I have to memorize the last five lines of Paradise Lost. Hold it back a little while. There, that wasn't so hard. Maybe because it reminds me of you and me sent away from home. I'll write it down for you. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them. Where to choose their place of rest? And providence their guide, they, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden took their solitary way. There you are. I wrote that without looking at the book, and it's right, too, because I just checked it word by word. Not so bad, is it? In fact, it sounds great if you recite it in the bathroom when no one's in the shower or taking a, a dump. <laughs> Love, Andy. <laughs> Thank you for your letter, which was a little too long. <laughs> I guess you have a lot of interesting things to say, Andy, but some of them are not terribly interesting to me. <laughs> I want to hear more about your feelings. For instance, here are my feelings. This place stinks. But I don't want to go back home because Hooper McPhail stinks. And I haven't heard of another boarding school that doesn't stink, which means that life stinks in general. Those are my feelings for this week. Right soon. Love me. One feeling I have almost all the time is that I, I miss my dog Porgy. Remember him? Our black cocker who peed in the vestibule when you patted him when you came back to our house after the skating party? I miss him all the time. Some of the masters up here have dogs, and when I pat them, I miss Porgy even more. I dream about him. I wrote a composition about him for English called Will He Remember and got a 96 on it. It was about how I remember him, but will he remember me? I have a picture of him on my bureau, right next to my parents. By the way, could I have a picture of you too? Here's a picture of me taken at the Hartford bus station. I was all set to run away and then decided not to. This is all you get until I get my braces off Christmas vacation. Don't look at my hair, I'm changing it. By the way, do you know a boy there named Spencer Willis? There's a girl here, Annie Abbott, who met him in Edgartown last summer and thinks he's cute. Would you ask him what he thinks of her? Spencer Willis says Annie Abbott is a potential nympho. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's true. Annie says to tell Spencer he's a total turkey. Tell him she'd write and say so herself, but she's scared of barfing all over the page. <laughs> you get out for Thanksgiving? We don't because of the war. We do, but I don't. I've been grounded just for smoking one lousy Chesterfield out behind the art studio. So now I have to stay here and eat stale turkey with Cubans and Californians. <laughs> That's all right. I was supposed to meet Mummy in New York, but it looks like she can't be there anyway because she's going to Reno to divorce Hooper McPhail. <laughs> Yippee! Yay! He was a jerk and a pill, and he used to bother me in bed, if you must know. I like seeing your Christmas vacation, particularly with your braces off. I really like necking with you in the Watson's rumpus room. Would you go steady with me? I don't believe in going steady. It's against my religion. I hated that stuff with all those pairs of pimply people in the Watson's basement leaning on each other, swaying to that dumb music with all the lights off. If that's going steady, I say screw it. <laughs> my mother says you should meet as many boys as you can before you have to settle down and marry one of them. That way you'll make less of a mistake. Didn't work for her, but maybe it'll work for me. <laughs> can we at least go to the movies together during spring vacation? I don't know, Andy. I like seeing you, but I don't want to go home much anymore. My mother gets drunk a lot, if you must know, and 
with your brother, helping your mother with the gravy. I liked all that. You may not have as much money as we have, but you've got a better family. So, spring vacation, I'm going to visit my grandmother in Palm Beach. Ho-hum, at least I'll get a tan. P.S. Enclosed is a picture I drew of your dog, Porgy, who I remember from Christmas Eve. The nose is wrong, but don't you think the eyes are good? I'm stroking the fourth crew now. <laughs> Yesterday I rode number two on the third. Tomorrow I may row number six on the second or number four on the fifth. Who knows? But you, you get out there and you work your butt off, and the launch comes alongside and looks you over, and the next day they post a list on the bulletin board saying who row what. They never tell you what you did right or wrong, whether you're shooting your slide or bending your back or what. They just post the latest results for all to see. And some days, I think I'm doing really well, and I get sent down two crews. One day, I was obviously hacking around. They moved me up. There's no rhyme or reason. So I went to Mr. Clark, who's head of rowing, and I said, look, Mr. Clark, there's something wrong about this system. People are constantly moving up and down, and no one knows why. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with whether you're good or bad, strong or weak, uh, coordinated or uncoordinated. It all seems random, sir. And Mr. Clark said, that's life, Andy, and walked away. <laughs> well, maybe that's life, but it doesn't have to be life. You could easily make rules which made sense so the good ones moved up and the bad ones moved down, and people knew what was going on. I'm serious. I'm thinking about going to law school later on. Your last letter was too much about rowing. <laughs> Do you know a boy there named Steve Scully? I met him down in Florida, and he said he went to your school and was on the first crew. He said he was the fastest rower in the boat. Is that true? Or was he lying? I think he may have been lying. Steve Scully was lying. He doesn't even row. And if he didn't row faster than everyone else in the same boat, he'd mess the whole thing up. He said he got to second base with you. Is that true? Steve Scully is a lying son of a bitch, and you can tell him I said so. Will you be around this summer? I think I've got a summer job caddying, so no more camp. Thank God. I'll be visiting my father in California. I haven't seen him in four years. He has a new wife, and I have two half-sisters now. It's like going to find a whole new family. Oh, I hope. Do you like California? Write me about California. How's your second family? Did you get my letters? I checked with your mother and I had the correct address. How come you haven't answered me all summer? Back at school now, I hope everything's okay with you. Did you get my letters out in California or did you have a, ste a wicked stepmother who confiscated them? I don't want to talk about California, ever. For a while, I thought I had two families, but now I know I really don't have any. You're very lucky, Andy. You don't know it, but you are. But, but maybe I'm lucky, too, in another way. I was talking to Mrs. Wadsworth, who comes in from Hartford to teach us art. She says I have a real talent, both in drawing and in painting, and she's going to try me out in pottery as well. She says some afternoon she's going to take me just by myself to her studio in Hartford, and we'll do life drawings of her lover in just a jock strap. <laughs> Don't laugh. She says art and sex are sort of the same thing. <laughs> Dear Melissa, I have four questions, so please concentrate. One, will you come up to the midwinter dance? Two, if so, can you arrive on the 1122 Friday night train? Three, does the rector's wife have to write your headmistress telling her where you'll be staying? Four, does the rector's wife also have to write your mother? The answer is yes, except for my mother who won't care. I have to tell you this right off the bat. I am really goddamn mad at you. I invite you up here for the only dance my class has been able to go to since we got here. I meet you at the train and buy you a vanilla milkshake and bring you out to school in a taxi. I scold, score two goals for you during the hockey game the next afternoon. I buy you the $8 gardenia corsage. I make sure your dance card is filled with the most regular guys in school. And then what happens? I now hear that you sneaked off with Bob Bartram during the Vienna Waltz and necked with him in the coat room. I heard that from two guys. And then Bob himself brought it up yesterday at breakfast. He said,
says he French kissed you and touched both your breasts. I tried to punch him, but Mr. Enbody restrained me. <laughs> I'm really sore, Melissa. I consider this a betrayal of everything I hold near and dear, particularly since you would hardly even let me kiss you goodnight after we had cocoa at the rector's. And you know what I'm talking about, too. So don't expect any more letters from me or any telephone calls either during spring vacation. Sincerely yours. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I am. I hate that Bob Bartram. I hated him, even when I necked with him. <laughs> I know you won't believe that, but it's true. You can be attracted to someone you hate. Well, maybe you can't, but I can. So, all right, I necked with him, but he never touched my chest. And if he says he did, he should be strung up by his testicles. You tell him that for me at breakfast. Anyway, I got carried away, Andy, and I'm a stupid bitch, and I'm sorry. I felt so guilty about it that I didn't want to kiss you after the cocoa. And besides, Andy, gulp, er, uh, oh, how do I say this? With you, it's different. You're like a friend to me. You're like a brother. I've never had a brother, and I don't have too many friends, so you're both, Andy. You're it. My mother says you must never say that to a man, but I'm saying it anyway, and it's true. Maybe if I didn't know you so well, maybe if I hadn't grown up with you, maybe if we hadn't written all these goddamn letters all the time, I could have kissed you the way I kissed Bob Bartram. Oh, but please, let's see each other's spring vacation, please. I count on you, Andy. I need you. I think sometimes I'd go stark raving mad if I didn't have you to hold on to. I really think that sometimes. Much love.
Greetings from New Hampshire. This card shows the town we're near where we sneak in and buy beer. We're cleaning the place up now and putting out the boat docks and caulking the canoes because the kids arrive tomorrow. Gotta go, right soon. I miss you. I really wish you had come to the Campbell sports party. Dear Melissa, Sandy McCarthy arrived from home for the second shift here at camp and he told me all about the Campbell sports party. <laughs> he said you wore a two-piece bathing suit and ran around goosing girls and pushing boys into the pool. Do you enjoy that sort of crap? He said the other girls were furious at you. Don't you want the respect of other women? Sandy also said you let Bucky Zeller put a tennis ball into your cleavage. Are you a nympho or what? Don't you ever like just sitting down somewhere and making conversation? Sandy says you're turning into a hot box. You like having that reputation? Hell, I thought there was a difference between you and Gretchen LaSalle's. Maybe I was wrong. Don't you care about anything in this world except hacking around? Don't you feel any obligation to help the poor people, for example? Sometimes, I think your big problem is you're so rich, you don't have enough to do, so you start playing grab-ass with people. I'm sorry to say these things, but what Sandy told me made me slightly disgusted, frankly. I wrote you a letter from New Hampshire. Did you receive it? Probably the Taft, since 
The Duncan's a pretty seedy joint. Make it the Duncan. <laughs> I hear the taft is loaded with parents all milling around the lobby keeping tabs on who goes up in the elevators. Can't wait till the 16th. The Duncan it is! Hubba hubba! Good year rubber! <laughs> thinking about the weekend. I can't get it out of my mind. It wasn't much good, was it? I don't mean just the Duncan, I mean the whole thing. We didn't really click, did we? I always had the sense that you were looking over my shoulder, looking for someone else and ditto with me. Both of us seemed to be expecting something different from what was there. As for the Hotel Duncan, I don't know, maybe I had too many sea breezes. Maybe you did. But what I really think is that there were too many people in that hotel room. Besides you and me, it seemed my mother was there egging us on, and my father shaking his head, and your mother zonked out on the couch, and Miss Hawthorne and your grandmother sitting on the sidelines watching us like hawks. Anyway, I was a dud. I admit it. I'm sorry. I went to the infirmary on Monday and talked to the doctor about it. He said these things happen all the time, particularly when there's a lot of pressure involved. The woman doesn't have to worry about it so much, but the man does. Anyway, it didn't happen with Gretchen LaSalle's. You can write and ask her if you like. You know what I think is wrong? These letters, these goddamn letters. That's what's wrong with us, in my humble opinion. I know you more from your letters than I do in person. And maybe that's why I was looking over your shoulder. I was looking for the person who's been in these letters all these years. Or for the person who's not in these letters. I don't know. All I know is, you're not quite the same when I see you, and you're really not. I'm not saying you're a jerk in person. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm just saying that all this letter writing has messed us up. It's a bad habit made us seem like people we're not. So maybe what was wrong was that there were two people missing in the Hotel Duncan that night. Namely, the real you and the real me. Whatever the matter is, we're in real trouble, you and I. That I realize. So now what are we going to do about it? Maybe we should just concentrate on dancing together. Then we can still hold each other and move together and get very subtly sexy with each other and not have to deliver the goods all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean. Come to think of it, maybe that's why they sent us to dancing school in the first place. Maybe that's why dancing was invented. At least we should stop writing letters for a while. You can start telephoning me, actually. Here is our dorm number, Wilson 12486. I hate talking to you on the telephone. Yours is in the hall, and ours is right by the college dining room. People are always coming and going and making cracks. Telephoning is not letter writing at all. I called the telephone company. They put a private phone in my room. Rogers 22403. It's sort of expensive, but at least we can talk. The reason I'm writing is because your phone's always busy. <laughs> or else ours is, and I can't afford a private one. Maybe we should just start writing letters again. No letters, please. Now order that telephone. I'll lend you the dough. Just think about it. You can talk back and forth and hear someone's real voice and get to know someone in life rather than on writing paper, for God's sake. And get that phone, please. I'm writing because when I telephoned, you just hung up on me. <laughs> One thing about letters, you can't hang up on them. You can't tear up letters, though, and close with the pieces. Send them to Angela Atkinson at Sarah Lawrence. What the hell's the matter? I hear you're now writing long letters twice a week to Angela Atkinson. That was the matter. Okay, here goes. The reason I'm writing Angie Atkinson is because <laughs> I just don't think I can stop writing letters, particularly to girls. As I told you before, in some ways, I feel most alive when I'm holed up in some corner writing things down. I pick up a pen, and almost immediately, everything seems to take shape around me. I love to write. I love writing my parents, because then I become the ideal son. I love writing essays for English, because then I am, for a short while, a true scholar. I love writing letters to the newspaper, notes to my friends, Christmas cards, anything where I have to put down words. I love writing you. 
You most of all. I always have. I feel like a true lover when I'm writing you. This letter, which I'm writing with my own hand, with my own pen, in my own penmanship, comes from me and no one else, and is a present of myself to you. It's not typewritten, though I have learned how to type, and there's no copy of it, though I suppose I could use a carbon, and it's not a telephone call, which is dead as soon as it's over. No, this is just me, me, the way I write, the way my writing is, the way I want to be to you, giving myself across a distance, not keeping or retaining any part of it for myself, giving this piece of myself to you totally. And you can tear me up and throw me out or keep me and read me today, tomorrow, anytime you want until you die. Oh boy, Andy. <laughs> Love, Melissa. <laughs> no, I meant what I wrote in my last letter. I thought about it. I thought about all those dumb things which were done to us when we were young. We had absent parents, slapping nurses, stupid rules, obsolete schooling, empty rituals, hopelessly confusing sexual customs. Oh my God, when I think about it now, it's almost unbelievable. It's a fantasy. It's like back in the Oz books, the way we grew up. But they gave us an out in the land of Oz. They made us right. They didn't make us write particularly well, and they didn't always give us important things to write about, but they did make us sit down and organize our thoughts and convey those thoughts on paper as clearly as we could to another person. Thank God for that. That saved us, or at least it saved me. So I have to keep writing letters. If I can't write them to you, I'll have to write them to someone else. I don't think I could ever stop writing completely now. Can I come up and see you next weekend? Or better yet, won't you please escape from that suburban Sing Sing and come down here and see me? <laughs> I wrote my way into this problem, and God damn it, I'm writing my way out. I'll make another reservation at the Hotel Duncan, and I promise I'll put down my pen and give you a better time. Dear Andy, guess what? Right while I was in the middle of reading your letter, Jack Duffield telephoned from Amherst and asked me for a weekend up there. So I said yes before I got to where you asked me. Sorry, sweetie, but it looks like the telephone wins in the end. Dear Melissa, somehow I don't think this is the end. It could be, but I don't really think it is. At least I hope it isn't. Love, Andy. Merry Christmas from Manila. I've been 
transferred to an admiral staff. Happy New Year from Aspen. What are you doing in Aspen? Going steadily downhill. <laughs> Hello from Hong Kong. Goodbye to San Francisco. Konnichiwa, ohayo gozaimasu. Shore, shore duty in Japan. Hey, you. Rumor has it you're hooked up with some little Jap foreign girl out there. Say it isn't so. <laughs> Mother wrote that you're living with some Japanese geisha girl and your family's all upset. Is that true? <laughs> Did you get my letter? You're so far away and your Navy address is so peculiar, I'm not sure I'm reaching you. I hear you're seriously involved with a lovely Japanese lady. <laughs> Would you write me about this? Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I thought you might appreciate this card. It's a print by the 19th century artist Hiloshige. It's called Two Lovers Meeting on a Bridge in the Rain. Love, and Hey, you sly dog. Are you getting subtle in your old age? Are you trying to tell me something? If so, tell me more. I told my psychiatrist about the great love affair you're having in Japan. I said I felt suddenly terribly jealous. He said that most American men have to get involved with a dark-skinned woman before they can connect with the gorgeous blonde goddesses they really love. <laughs> he brought up James Fenimore Cooper and Faulkner and John Ford movies and went on and on. Is that true? Write me what you think. I'm dying to hear from you. Did you get my last letter? I hope I didn't sound flip. Actually, I've just become involved with someone, too. His first name is Darwin, and he works on Wall Street, where he believes in the survival of the fittest. I'd love to hear from you. Your mother told my mother that you've decided to marry your Japanese friend and bring her home. Oh, no. Gasp, sob, sigh, say it isn't so. I've decided to marry Darwin. He doesn't know it yet, but he will. <laughs> Won't you at least wish me luck? Lieutenant Junior Grade Andrew M. Ladd III regrets that he's <coughs> unable to accept the kind invitation of... Dear Annie, thank you for the lovely Japanese bowl. I'll put flowers in it when you come to visit us. If you come to visit us and if you bring flowers, Maybe you'll just bring your Japanese war bride and we can all sit around and discuss Rashomon. <laughs> I know you'll like Darwin when he laughs. It's like Pinocchio turning into a donkey. <laughs> We're living in a carriage house in New Canaan close to the train station and I've got a studio all of my own. <sighs> P.S. Won't you please write me about your big romance? Mother says your parents won't even talk about it anymore. Dear Melissa, I'm writing to tell you this. Outside of you, and I mean outside of you, this was probably the most important thing that ever happened to me. And I mean was, because it's over, it's gone, I'm coming home, and that's all I ever want to say about it ever again. Mr. and Mrs. Darwin H. Cobb announced the birth of their daughter, Francesca. Many congratulations on the baby. Harvard Law School yet. Are you getting all stuffy and self-important? As you know, I've always liked to write letters. I decided I might do better trying to write laws, which, after all, are the letters that civilization writes to itself. Yes, you are getting all stuffy and self-important. <laughs> Come and have a drink with us sometime. We're right on the way to New York, and sooner or later everyone comes to New York. Read the New York Times account of your show in Stamford. Sounds like you're causing a series of seismic shocks up and down the Merritt Parkway. Don't joke about my work. There's more there than what they said in your goddamn Bible, the New York Times. Enclosed, see what other critics said. Notice they think I'm good. I am, too, or could be, if I could only focus. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I know you're good. I've always known it. Here you made law review, whatever that means. I assume you review laws. <laughs> I wish you'd review some of the marriage laws. <laughs> Just a quick note, are you in any trouble? I don't understand your last note. We're fine, all fine, everyone's fine. <laughs> Congratulations on baby number two. <coughs> number two is the perfect way to describe this particular baby. <laughs> Washington, here clerking for Supreme Court Justice, which
Which isn't quite as fancy as it sounds. Dear Andy, I was very sorry to hear about the death of your father. I know he was a great influence on you, and I know you loved him very much. I also know he didn't like me. I'm sure he thought I was bad for you, and I probably was. Still, he was a good, decent man, and I always knew where I stood with him when you'd bring me home to your family, back in the old days, back in the land of Oz. I wish I'd had a father like that. Please accept my deepest sympathies. Love, Melissa. Dear Melissa, thank you for your note on my father. I did love him. He was a classy guy, the best of his breed. Even now he's gone, I can still hear him reminding me of my obligations to my family, my country, and myself in roughly that order. All my life he taught me that those born to privilege have special responsibilities, which is, I suppose, why I came home alone from Japan why I chose the law, and why I'll probably enter politics at some level sometime on down the line. Thanks for writing. Love, Andy. Merry Christmas. I'm enclosing a snapshot Mother took of me and the girls. Don't I look domestic? <laughs> Stop looking at my hair. By the way, you'll notice you know who is not in the picture. Thanks for the Christmas card. Are you in trouble? Greetings from Reno. <laughs> Could I stop by Washington on my way back east? Let me know when you're coming. You can meet Jane. Jane? I'm going out with a great girl named Jane. Melissa Gardner Cobb regrets that she will be unable to accept the kind invitation Dear Melissa, I had to add my two cents worth to Jane's thank you note for the wedding present. Guess who's jealously peeking over my shoulder to make sure that this isn't a love letter? First of all, thanks for the <laughs> present, whatever it was. Ah, a tray. I am now told it was a tray. A hand-painted tray. Hand-painted by you, I bet. Anyway, thank you. I hope all goes well with you as it does with us. We'll be moving to New York next fall. I've got a job with one of those high-powered law firms. It'll probably be stuffy as hell for a while, but I'll learn the ropes. Besides, it's in my home state and might be a good jumping off place for something political a little way down the line. We both want you to come to dinner once you're settled in, and don't say you've never come to New York. Sooner or later, everyone comes to New York, as someone once wrote me a long, long time ago. Merry Christmas from us to you. Where are you these days? Happy birthday, see? Even a married man never forgets. Get well soon. Mother wrote that you had had some difficulty. I hope it's not serious and that by now you're feeling fine. I can't remember exactly what one dozen red roses are supposed to say, but here they are, and I hope they say, cheer up. Hey. I sent you some flowers a while back. Did you receive them? You all right? Dear Andy, yes, I'm all right. Yes, I got your flowers. Yes, I'm fine. No, actually, I'm not fine. And they tell me I've got to stop running around saying I am. I'm here at this posh joint outside Boston drawing out for $155 a day. One of my problems is that I got slightly too dependent on the Kickapoo Joy Juice a habit which they tell me I picked up during the party days back in our town. Another is that I slide into these terrible lows. Mommy says I drag everybody down, and I guess she's right. A anyway, the result is that my ex has taken over custody of the girls, and I'm holed up here, popping tranquilizers, talking my head off in single and group psychiatric sessions, and turning into probably the biggest bore in the greater Boston area. Have you thought about doing some painting again? That might help. Did you get my note about taking up art? You were good. You know it. You should keep it up. I did get your note. I have taken it up, and it helps, really. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm channeling my rage, enlarging my vision, all that. I hope all goes well with you, and wait. Looking it up in my little black book. Aha. Jade. <laughs> it's Jade. 
hope all goes well with you and Jane. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Andy and Jane Ladd and to Andrew the Fourth. Guess the name of the dog. Porgy. You got it. <laughs> Merry Christmas from San Antonio. I'm trying the Southwest. I can see the most incredible shapes from my bedroom window. And there's also a pretty incredible shape now sleeping in my bed. <laughs> Season's greetings from the Ladd family. Mother wrote and said that you were planning on getting married again. I was. I did. I'm not now. <laughs> Donna Rhodes and McAllister announced the appointment to partnership of Mr. Andrew M. Ladd III. Dear Andy, now you're such a hotshot lawyer, could you help me get my children back? Darwin hardly lets me near them, and when he does, they behave as if I had some contagious disease. I wasn't much of a mother, but maybe I could improve if I just had the legal responsibility. Better stay out of this one. Our past connections. Conflict of interest. Hello from Egypt. I'm trying to start again in the cradle of civilization. <laughs> Christmas greetings from the lads. Andy, Jane, Drew, Nicholas, and Ted. And of course, Porgy. <laughs> I'm thinking of moving to Los Angeles. Do you know anyone in Los Angeles? Does anyone know anyone in Los Angeles? <laughs> Joy to the world from all the lads. Note our new address. Merry Christmas. Hey, you, what's going on? Just when I decide to move to New York, I see you scampered off to the suburbs. I find the suburbs generally safer. Chicken. Mother wrote that you won some important election for the Republicans. I'm terribly disappointed. I love all politicians, but I find Democrats better in bed. <laughs> I'm a liberal Republican <laughs> with a strong commitment to women's rights. Doesn't that count? <laughs> Depends on your position. <laughs> Paintings and drawings by Melissa Gardner. The Hastings Gallery, 422 Broadway, March 18th through April 30th. Opening reception, March 20th, 6 to 8 p.m. Note, I've gone back to my maiden name. That's a laugh. Got your announcement for your new show. Good luck. P.S. Love to have one of your paintings. We could use a little excitement on our living room walls. Seriously, what would one cost? Come to the show and find out. It's never made your show, I'm sorry. Things came up. Chicken again? You're right. Actually, it's just as well. I'm going through what the <coughs> critics call an anarchistic phase. They say I'm dancing on the edge of an abyss. You'd better stay away. I might take you with me when I fall. Dear friends, Jane tells me that it's about time I took a crack at the annual Christmas letter, so here goes. <laughs> Let's start at the top with our quarterback, Jane herself, who never ceases to amaze us all. Not only has she continued to be a superb mother to our three sons, but she's also managed to commute into the city and hold down a part-time job at the gift shop of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <coughs> Furthermore, she is now well on her way to completing a full-fledged master's degree in arts administration at SUNY Purchase. More power to Jane, so say we all. <laughs> We are also proud of all three boys. Young Drew was soccer captain at Exeter last year and hopes to go on to Yale. Nicholas, our rebel in residence, has become a computer genius in high school and has already received several tantalizing offers for summer jobs from local electronics firms. <laughs> we all know it's tougher to place our youngsters in meaningful summer employment than to get them into Harvard, so we're very proud of how far Nick has come. <laughs> Ted, our last, but in no way our least, now plays the clarinet in the school band at Dickinson Country Day. Since Jane and I are barely capable of singing You Are My Sunshine without going disastrously flat, when we hear him produce his dulcet sounds, we look at each other in a wild surmise. <laughs> We recently bought the, summer, uh, the family summer place for my brother and sister and hope to spend as much time as we can there gardening, relaxing, and as the boys say, generally vegging out. Jane and I have become killers in the tennis court and hereby challenge all comers. If 
any of our friends are in the Adirondack area this summer, we expect telephone calls, we expect visits, we expect elaborate house presents. <laughs> I've enjoyed very much serving on the state legislature. We proposed and written a number of bills and we won some and lost some. All my life I've had the wish to do something in the way of public service and it has been a great pleasure to put that wish into practice. For those of my friends who have urged me to seek higher office, let me simply say that I have more than enough challenges right here where I am. Jane and the boys, join me in wishing each and all of you a happy holiday season. <laughs> Dear Andy, <laughs> if I ever get another one of those drippy Xerox Christmas letters from you, I think I will invite myself out to your ducky little house for dinner. <laughs> and when you're all sitting there eating terribly healthy food and discussing terribly important things and generally congratulating yourselves on all your accomplishments, I think that I will stand up on my chair and turn around and moan the whole fucking night. <laughs> You're right. It was a smug, dumb letter, and I apologize for it. Jane normally writes it, and it sounds better when she does. I always felt better writing to just one person at a time, such as to you. I guess what I was really saying is that as far as my family is concerned, we're all managing to hold our heads above water in this tricky world. Jane and I have had our problems, but we're comfortable with each other now, and the boys, for the moment, are out of trouble. <laughs> Nikki seems to be off drugs now, and... <laughs> Ted is getting help on his stammer. <laughs> Corgi Jr., my old cocker, died, and I miss him too much to get a replacement. I'm thinking of running for the Senate next fall if O'Hara retires. What do you think? I really like your opinion. If you decide to answer this, you might write in care of my office address. Jane has a slight tendency toward melodrama, particularly after she got a hold of your last little note. <laughs> Merry Christmas 
and love from us all. <laughs> Saw you on 60 Minutes. You looked fabulous. That was a great little pep talk in the Senate on our responsibilities to Latin America, but don't forget to keep your eye on the ball. Thanks for your card. What ball? The ball is that money doesn't solve everything. It helps, but not as much as people think. Take it from one who knows. That's the ball. <laughs> Merry Christmas and love. What are you up to these days? I'm trying to work with clay. Remember that kind of clay we used in Mrs. Mickler's art class in fourth grade, that old gray stuff? We called it plasticine. I'm trying to work with that. I'm making cats, dogs. <laughs> I even made a kangaroo jumping over a glass of orange juice. Remember that? I'm trying to get back to some of those old, old feelings I had back in the homeland. I have to find feelings, any, any feelings, otherwise I'm dead. Come down and help me search. I have a studio down in Soho and we could, uh, well, we could at least have dinner and talk about old times, couldn't we, Senator Ladd? P.S. Did you know that my mother got married again at the age of 82? <laughs> to my father's brother, yes. So now you have to call her Mrs. Gardner again, just like the old days. Wheel seems to be coming around full circle, hint, hint. A quick note on the way to the airport. When you write, put attention Mrs. Walpole on the envelope. She's my private secretary. I've alerted her, and she'll pass your letters directly on to me. Otherwise, the whole office staff seems to get a peek. <laughs> In haste. I'm having a show opening January 28th through February 25th. Won't you come? I'd love to have you see what I've been up to. Maybe it'll ring a few old bells. Can't make it. I'll be on an official visit to the Philippines most of February, and then a week spring skiing at Stowe for the boys. Good luck. <clears throat> How'd the show go? Haven't heard from you. Tell me about the show. I want to hear from you, please. The show stank. Crowd hated it, critics hated it, I hated it. It was nostalgic shit. <laughs> can't go home again, you can't quote me on that. I'm turning to photography now. Realism, that's my bag, the present tense. Look at the modern world squarely in the face and don't blink. Oh, Andy, couldn't I see you? You're all I have left. I'll be in New York next Tuesday the 19th. Have to make a fundraising speech at a dinner. I could stop by your place afterwards. I'll be there all evening. Red roses. This time I think I know what they mean. All I know is that after last night, I want to see you again. Any chance of any other fundraisers coming up in the near future? <laughs> Sorry I've taken so long to reply. I've been upstate mending a few fences and then to Zurich for a three-day economic conference and then a weekend with Jane mending a few fences there. <laughs> Darling, I'll have to ask you not to telephone the office. Every call has to be logged in and most of them get screened by these over-eager over -eager college interns who like to rush back to Cambridge and New Haven and announce to their classmates in political science that Senator Ladd is shacking up on the side. The telephone simply isn't secure. <laughs> At long last, the letter beats out the telephone, my love. And guess what? I'm writing this with the old Parker 51 my grandmother gave me when I went away to school. I found it in the back of my bureau drawer with my scroll and key pin and my Lieutenant JG bars from the Navy and the Zippo lighter you gave me at some dance. The pen didn't even work at first. I had to clean it out and then traipse all over Washington looking for a store which still sells a bottle of ink. Anyway, feels good holding this thing again. Feels good writing to you again, longhand, forming my D's and T's the way Miss Emerson taught us so long ago. I know you've never liked writing letters, but now you have to, ha ha. As for business, I plan to come through New York next Wednesday and I'll call you from the airport if there's time to stop by. Sweetheart, I love seeing you. Come again. We'll be stopping through a week from next. Did you ever dream we'd be so good at sex? <laughs> Two uptight old wasps going at it like a sail at Brooks Brothers. <laughs> Let's go for a hundred. Oh my God, come again sooner, sooner. I'm already making plans. Have to go to San Francisco to visit the girls. Couldn't we meet somewhere on the I way? I don't see how we can possibly go public. Some country and some deliciously 
seedy motel. I don't see how. See you more than for just a few hours. Price we have to pay. I'm getting so I think about nothing but how we can. I'm not sure I can change my whole life so radically. Other politicians have gotten divorced. Rockefeller, Reagan. Jane. The children. My particular constituency. You would become the center of my life if you left. I don't think that I could. Because of the coming election, I don't see how I can. Dear Andy. A reporter called up from the Daily News. What do I do about it? Nothing. Suppose you know all this, but there's a crack about us at Newsweek, and Mother heard some radio talk show where they actually name names. What should I do? Go away? What? Nothing. They called Darwin. You know, they tracked him down. The son of a bitch told him this has been going on for years. Wish it had been. Now they're telephoning. What do I say? Say we're good old friends. Friends, I like good. I like old. I'm beginning to have problems. <laughs> then don't say anything. Hang up. This too shall pass. Will I be seeing you again? Better not for a while. I meant after the election. Better lie low for a while. I miss you terribly. Better lie low. I need you, Andy. You're my anchor man these days. Without you, I'm not sure that I can... Hold on now. Just hold on. Where were you? I waited three hours hoping that you'd at least call. Please, don't telephone. Mrs. Walpole was sick that day and... I haven't seen you in over a month now. The coming election. Surely you could at least take time out. If I want to be re-elected. I need you. I need to be with you. I don't know if I could... The election. The election. The election. I haven't heard from you in six weeks, Andy. Are you trying to tell me something, Andy? Is this it, Andy? Congratulations on landslide victory, love, Melissa. Could we meet at your place next Sunday night? No, thank God. I meant that we have to talk, Melissa. Uh-oh. Talk. I'm scared of talk. In fact, I dread it. Dearest Melissa, are you all right? That was a heavy scene last Sunday, but I know I'm right. We've got to go one way or the other, and the other leads nowhere. <clears throat> I know I sound like a stuffy prick, but I do feel I have a responsibility to Jane and the boys. And now, after the election, to my constituency, which had enough faith and trust in me to vote me back in, despite all that crap in the newspapers. And it wouldn't work with us anyway in the long run, sweetheart. We're too old. We're carrying too much old baggage on our backs. We'd last about a week if we got married. But we can still write letters, darling. We can always do that. Letters are still our strength and our salvation. Mrs. Walpole is still with us, and there's no reason why we can't continue to keep in touch with each other in this <coughs> wonderful old way. I count on your letters, darling. I always have, and I hope you'll count on mine. Are you there? I keep putting please forward on the envelopes, but who knows? Now, I've even resorted to the telephone, but all I get is your damn machine. Please. I need to hear from you. Senator and Mrs. Andrew M. Ladd III and family send you warm holiday greetings and every good wish for the new year. Andy Ladd, is that you? Blow dry. Tailored and jogging trim at 55. Hiding behind that lovely wife with her heels together and her hands folded discreetly over her snatch. <laughs> <laughs> and is that your new dog, Andy? Whoa, I see you have graduated to a golden retriever. And are those your sons and heirs? And help, is that a grandchild? Someone's arms? God, Andy, you look like the Holy Family. <laughs> Season's greetings and happy holidays and even Merry Christmas, Senator Ladd. We who are about to die salute you. Just reread your last note. What's this we who are about to die stuff? May I see you again? I want to see you again, if I may. Dear Mrs. Gardner, I seem to have lost touch with Melissa again. I wonder if you might send me her latest address. 
Dear Melissa, your mother wrote that you'd return to the land of Oz. I'm flying up next Thursday to see you. No! Please! Don't! Please stay away. I've, uh, I've let myself go. I'm fat. I'm ugly. My hair is uh, horrible. I'm locked into the funny farm all week, and then mother gets me weekends if I'm good. They put me on all sorts of new drugs. Half the time, I don't make sense at all. Can't even do finger painting now without fucking it up. My girls won't even uh, talk to me on the telephone now. They say I upset them too much. Oh, I, I've made a mess of things. Andy, I've made a total ghastly mess. I don't like life anymore. I hate it. Sometimes I think that if you and I, if, if we had... I would just stay away, Andy, please. Arriving Saturday morning, we'll meet you at your mother. No! I don't want to see you. I won't be there. I'll be gone, Andy. I swear I'll be gone. Dear Mrs. Gardner, I think the first letter I ever wrote was to you, accepting an invitation for Melissa's birthday party. Now I'm writing you again about her death. I want to say a few things on paper I couldn't say at her funeral, both when I spoke and when you and I talked afterward. As you may know, Melissa and I managed to keep in touch with each other most of our lives, primarily through letters. Even now, as I write this letter to you, I feel that I'm also writing it to her. Ah, oh, you're in your element now, Andy. We had a complicated relationship, she and I, all our lives. We went in very different directions, but somehow, during all those years, I think we managed to give something to each other. Melissa expressed all the dangerous and rebellious feelings I never dared admit to. Now he tells me. And I like to think I gave her some <coughs> sense of balance. Balance? Oh, hell, I give up. I have it your way, Andy. Balance. Most of the things I did in life, I did with her partly in mind. And if I said or did an inauthentic thing, I could almost hear her groaning over my shoulder. But now she's gone, I really don't know how I'm going to get along without her. You'll survive, Andy. I have a wonderful wife, fine children, and a place in the world I feel proud of. But the death of Melissa suddenly leaves a huge gap in my life. Oh, no, Andy. The thought of never again being able to write to her, to connect to her, to get some signal back from her, fills me with an emptiness which is hard to describe. Stop. I don't think there are many men in this world who have had the benefit of such a friendship with such a woman. But it was more than friendship, too. I know now that I loved her. I loved her even from the day I met her, when she walked into second grade looking like the lost princess of Oz. Please, I can't bear it. I don't think I've ever loved anyone the way I loved her. And I know I never will again. She was at the heart of my life. And already, I miss her desperately. <coughs> I just wanted to say this to you and to her. Sincerely, Andy Ladd.